Okay, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, moderate session two with uh, Judy Lieberman. Uh, I'd actually like to take a moment just to thank the organizers for putting together such a great uh, uh, symposium. Uh, we're off to a great start and uh, we're looking forward to the rest of the speakers. Um, this uh, session is entitled Co-Infection uh, Insights from the Field uh, and Lab Models of Disease. Uh, for our first speaker, we're uh, very pleased to have Graham Menkes from um, uh, South Africa. He's an infectious disease uh, clinician at the Institute of Infectious uh, Diseases and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town. Also has an appointment at uh, Imperial College Lon London. Uh, I won't go into his biography in detail. It's in your uh, 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 packet, uh, but I will say that he's uh, been uh, focused in his research on immune reconstitution and inflammatory syndrome, uh, both in TB and uh, in cryptococcal infection. Uh, his current uh, his talk in this session will be about TB, and we'll be hearing about the cryptococcal work uh, uh, this afternoon. So, uh, 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 introduce Graham. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Bob, and uh, thanks to Anne and the organisers for the invitation to to come to chilly Boston from warm Cape Town. Um, I've uh, uh, been asked to talk on TB iris, which has really been the, the a major focus of our research and probably what's kept me busy through for most of my waking hours over the last 10 years um, and share some of the insights mm -hmm. from, from our, our research on TB iris. And I'm going to deal mainly with our clinical research, but just give you some flavor of the immunology research that we've also taken to understand the pathogenesis of TB iris. So um, just to, by way of background, just to say that there are recognized two forms of TB iris. The one occurs in patients who are on TB treatment, start ART, and develop a clinical deterioration uh, while on effective uh, TB treatment, and that's termed paradoxical TB iris. The other is patients who have unrecognized TB when they start antiretroviral therapy. Soon after starting ART with immune recovery, they unmask their TB and present with accelerated inflammatory forms of TB that we term unmasking TB iris. And it's really the, the top uh, a form of TB, uh, TB iris, the paradoxical TB iris, that I'm going to focus on exclusively in the talk today. Um, so people know this well. When we start antiretroviral therapy in patients uh, with HIV, there's a dramatic decrease in viral load in the peripheral blood in the first weeks of antiretroviral <coughs> therapy. Um, within the first two weeks, there's a, uh, an almost two log drop in the viral load uh, in the peripheral blood. That allows the CD4 count to recover. There's a biphasic recovery, an initial kick up of an average of 75 cells in the first month, and then a more gradual recovery after that. But that's not the whole story. Uh, in patients starting antiretroviral therapy, there are a lot of functional immune changes that occur very early on, coincident with that dramatic uh, fall in viral load. And this is work that we've done. Uh, fortunately, Stefan's given the introduction to gene transcriptional profiling but that we've looked at uh, patients with HIV TB starting antiretroviral therapy over the first, uh, the initial weeks of antiretroviral therapy and look at, looked at the gene expression profile. And just in summary, you can see over the first two weeks of antiretroviral therapy, there are dramatic changes in, in gene uh, expression, both mostly upregulation of a number of, of cell signaling pathways, inflammatory pathways, and other uh, pathways in peripheral blood, suggesting that, that, that these are the changes in the immune function that drive the clinical manifestations that we see in, in, in TB iris. And I'll come back to, to some of this work later. Um, so, so essentially what's happening with TB iris is this suppression of HIV replication, early reversal of immune suppression, uh, added, uh, both systemically and reflected in, in the peripheral blood, uh, as well as probably at a tissue level, uh, that, that uh, the changes in immune function driving inflammation directed at the antigens of TB that are still persistent in the tissue despite TB treatment. And this results in <coughs> clinical deterioration that manifests with TB iris. So this, in terms of the clinical features of TB iris, this slide really summarizes uh, the, the number of publications in the literature that have addressed uh, the, the characterization of the condition. Essentially, the incidence of TB iris varies according, uh, across different observational studies from around 
to up to 54% in, a, in a, a study recently published from India. And this variation in, in the incidence probably reflects the study design. Some of the earlier studies were retrospective chart reviews, whereas obviously in prospective studies, uh, uh, cases are more easily ascertained, as well as some studies reflect patients who are at higher risk for TB iris with more disseminated TB, low CD4 counts, and therefore the, the incidence in that setting is going to be greater. In our setting in Cape Town, we found that it, it occurs in about 20% of outpatients with, with uh, HIV, TB starting ART, and about 40% of inpatients, obviously reflecting a higher risk uh, group among the inpatients. The onset of symptoms in our studies has, has uh, been characteristically around 14 days after starting antiretroviral therapy. So the median in just about all the studies that we've done in many of the studies in the literature is two weeks, and most of the cases uh, if you take a careful history, the onset of symptoms is within the first month of starting <laughs> antiretroviral therapy. There's considerable morbidity that results from TB iris. Up to a, about a half of patients require hospitalization for diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. Uh, and the median duration in the literature is between two and three months. So that that's the duration from the onset of symptoms to the resolution of symptoms. In, in our cohort studies, uh, the median duration has been uh, about 70 days. There's a subgroup of patients, about 30 to 40 percent of patients, where the syndrome uh, goes on for longer than three months. Um, and in, in a small group of patients, it can persist for over a year. And those are patients who typically manifest with separative manifestations, as I'll come back to. Mortality uh, cross studies has been infrequent related to TB iris. So in the meta-analysis that was published, 3% of patients who developed TB iris had, had a, a <coughs> fatal outcome. Uh, that's not always death due to TB iris. It, it, in many instances, it's death due to other opportunistic infections because these are patients with a, a, a substantial underlying mortality risk because they have advanced HIV. The one exception is patients with neurological manifestations where the mortality is substantially higher, anything between 25 and 75 percent in, in uh, studies that have looked at patients with neurological TB iris. So from a clinician's point of view working in the field, one of the important issues about TB iris is there's no diagnostic test that tells you that this patient has TB iris, and it essentially is a clinical diagnosis. And this is the kind of checklist that we work through, uh, essentially approaching a patient who deteriorates with HIV TB starting antiretroviral therapy. The first thing is, was the diagnosis of TB confirmed or very likely in the first place? Was the improvement on antiretroviral therapy prior to starting and at, on TB treatment prior to starting ART? Uh, is the symptom onset at the typical time period on ART? And is there deterioration with inflammatory features of TB? There's a, a diagnostic workup uh, that, uh, that one undertakes to exclude potential differential diagnoses, and that obviously depends on the organ system involved. So those patients with pulmonary presentations the differential diagnosis would, for instance, be bacterial pneumonia or PCP. And then very importantly, to exclude drug-resistant TB that has an important overlap with TB iris. So there's a very wide spectrum of, of clinical severity in TB iris. Some patients merely manifest with recurrence of fevers and night sweats, and that lasts for one or two weeks and resolves, and that's the full story of TB iris. Other patients can develop potentially life-threatening neurological disease, as I said, with a high mortality. But it is a very heterogeneous condition. However, it is possible to identify a number of uh, syndromes that occur with, with TB iris, and I've listed them on this slide. I'm going to go through the, the first five in the list in subsequent slides, but just to point out that many patients, in addition to having specific organ system involvement, have quite a, a pronounced systemic inflammatory syndrome. Uh, with manifesting with high fevers, marked tachycardias, often even outpatients might have a heart rate of 140, 150, um, and not be sick enough to require hospitalization, but have a very pronounced uh, tachycardia, uh, we think driven by the inflammatory, uh, systemic inflammatory response. Patients can develop quite substantial weight loss due to TB iris alone. Just to point out, although the, these are s specific organ system involvements, uh, that many patients have an overlap. They have more than one organ system involved, so they present with lymphadenitis plus pulmonary involvement. So to just go through the, the various organ systems involved, 
Firstly, lymphadenitis in our se setting it occurs in 40% of patients with TB iris. What's characteristic is, is these, the, the lymph node enlargement has prominent acute inflammatory features, unlike patients with uh, TB adenitis who are not on antiretrovirals. So you can see often uh, a marked red overlying skin, tender, warm, similar to a bacterial abscess. Uh, typically, the, there's firm enlargement and then separation within a few weeks of the forming pus collections. Uh, having lymph node involvement is an independent predictor of a more prolonged course of TB iris. And in our setting, um, about 3% of patients have TB iris that lasts for longer than a year. And those are patients typically with the separative lymphadenitis as mm -hmm. their manifestation of TB iris. Another important uh, uh, organ system involved is obviously the lung and typically manifesting with enlargement of pulmonary infiltrates. This patient w uh, manifesting with worsening of pulmonary cavitation due to TB iris and this occurs in about 40% of patients with TB iris. Neurological TB iris I've already mentioned. About 1 in 10 patients with TB iris develops neurological manifestations. If you take patients with TB meningitis starting ART, about half of them will develop uh, TB meningitis iris. The manifestations are, are meningitis, enlargement of tuberculomas, and a radicular myelopathy with paraparesis. And it can also occur in patients who do not have neurological involvement uh, recognized prior to ART. They start ART and they develop manifest neurological involvement after ART with TB iris. And I've already mentioned the substantial mortality that can occur with, with neurological involvement. This is just one example of a patient with TB meningitis diagnosed, you can see some uh, basal in, uh, contrast enhancement. Patient then started ART, developed recurrence of meningitis symptoms with far more marked basal enhancement at the time of developing TB meningitis iris. And uh, one thing that we've shown in our studies, my colleague Suzanne Marais, who's uh, followed up patients carefully with HIV and TB meningitis from uh, the diagnosis of TB meningitis through to their TB treatment starting ART and then developing TB iris is that there's a cr close correlation between CNF, CSF <coughs> neutrophils and the, and, and the development of uh, TB iris manifesting with meningitis. So what you see is patients at the time of, of TBM diagnosis, uh, those who subsequently developed iris had far higher neutrophil levels in the CSF. Those neutrophil levels went down on TB treatment when they started ART and then up again at the development of, of, uh, of iris. Uh, this was, uh, the lymphocytes also went up with the development of iris, but the correlation with baseline risk for TB iris was only seen with neutrophils. So it suggests that neutrophils have an important role in the pathogenesis of neurological TB iris. This is just one uh, unfortunate example of, of a fatal case of, of uh, TB iris. A young woman who had TB meningitis, started TB treatment, improved, went home, started ART, came back with hemiparesis and seizures, and despite stopping antiretroviral therapy, high-dose dex dexamethasone uh, and supportive treatment died two days later with this huge enlargement of a, a, a cerebral tuberculoma and midline shift and associated cerebral edema. So an, another important group of features of, of TB iris are the abdominal manifestations, often underappreciated by clinicians. This can manifest with lymph node enlargement in the abdomen, abscess formation, peritonitis, as well as specific organ involvement, such as splenic involvement, as you can see in this image here. Uh, and that's, there are cases in the literature reported of splenic rupture due to splenic enlargement of TB iris. And you can see examples of pus collections in the abdomen. One of the, the big uh, challenges for clinicians is this condition, hepatic TB iris, where there's uh, TB iris inflammation with granulomatous inflammation in the liver. This is just an example of a patient who was being treated for pericardial TB, started ART, and then developed a hepatic enlargement with characteristic cholestatic liver function derangements. Liver biopsy showed large granulomas in the liver, and this patient's, uh, the, the differential diagnosis was drug-induced liver injury. There was no evidence on the biopsy of that. Continued treatment, and the, the condition spontaneously resolved. Sometimes we treat these patients with steroids. And th the big issue is differentiating 
Hepatic TBI is from drug-induced liver injury. Obviously, patients are on a number of uh, treatments, the TB treatment, the antiretrovirals that can cause liver injury, and it can be difficult to differentiate these. In practice, some of the features that help to differentiate are the liver enlargement with hepatic TB iris, the cholestatic liver function derangement, and the presence of other TB iris manif manifestations. Uh, Drug-induced liver injury, typically with transaminitis. However, there might be overlap between these conditions, and it uh, sometimes needs a biopsy to differentiate them. Another important issue is the development of, of effusions. Uh, two examples, a patient who developed a massive pericardial effusion uh, due to TB iris requiring one liter of uh, pericardial syntesis drainage with potential uh, life-threatening pericardial tamponade, and patients who develop enlargement of pleural effusions due to TB iris. So in terms of the pathogenesis of this condition, um, We've done a lot of work on this in, in Cape Town in collaboration with other colleagues. Some of the important uh, factors that have been looked at are the role of antigen-specific cells, particularly in TB, CD4, uh, MTB-specific cells that have been associated uh, with the development of TB iris. It's also been speculated that uh, 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 dysfunction of T regulatory cells might have a role, but studies haven't really con confirmed that. One important driver is antigen load. The, uh, in TB meningitis, those patients who were TB culture positive are more likely to develop a TB iris, suggesting an antigen load has a role. The role of pro-inflammatory cytokines that I'll come back to, and then the role of, of innate immune cells uh, has also been uh, thought to play a role in TB iris. So just to look at the role of cytokines, this was a study that we performed looking at HIV TB patients starting ART looked at two weeks comparing those who developed TB iris to controls who did not uh, develop TB iris, and there was elevation in a number of cytokines, uh, a broad elevation of cytokines at two weeks in the patients who developed TB iris compared to controls. But across experimental conditions, these were the three cytokines that were most associated with TB iris, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, and interferon gamma. And then in terms of transcriptional profiling, to come back to what I discussed at the beginning, so a relatively small study, we've, we've compared 13 patients who developed TB iris and 13 controls with HIV TB who started ART who didn't develop TB iris um, and looked, and this is showing at the two-week time point on antiretroviral <coughs> therapy. And you can see that there is a clustering in, in red of the patients who developed TB iris, although there is some overlap, some patients who do did not develop TB iris clustered together with those who developed uh, TB iris and vice versa. And in pathways analysis, and I hope this comes out, you can see that uh, those patients, when we looked at the pathways that are upregulated in patients who develop TB iris compared to controls, in uh, the important pathways that are showing gene upregulation are toll like receptor signaling and pattern rec uh, recognition receptors. Uh, for bacteria and viruses. So suggesting that uh, pattern recognition uh, pathways on innate immune cells, uh, the upregulation of the genes involved in that are uh, an important part of the pathogenesis of TB iris. This is early uh, work. We need to still validate this and look at, at downstream investigation of these pathways. But suggesting that, that innate immune signaling does have a role in the pathogenesis of TB iris. So to move on to, on, on to treatment, we conducted between 2005 and 2008 the, the first uh, clinical trial of a treatment for TB iris, and essentially the rationale and, and the, the equipoise uh, that, that justified this, this, this trial was that there were anecdotal reports in the literature of patients responding to steroids, but obviously potential risks associated with steroids in patients with advanced HIV. It's a relatively small study. 110 participants, patients randomized to either receive prednisone or placebo. Patients with life-threatening TB iris were not enrolled in the study. So if they had neurological involvement, they were excluded from the study and treated with steroids in the clinical service. Patients could also be switched to open-label prednisone if they de uh, deteriorated on the study. And this just uh, summarizes the study design. So we assessed patients who were referred to the hospital with presumed TB iris using a clinical case definition. If they satisfied that clinical case definition and provided consent, they were uh, uh, randomized to receive either prednisone uh, 
or placebo, and you can see the dose listed there. It was a four-week course starting at 1.5 milligrams per kilogram per day, and then patients were followed up three, for three months to ascertain uh, the endpoints, and the primary endpoint was a cumulative endpoint of days of hospitalization plus outpatient therapeutic procedures, which were counted as one additional day of hospitalization, that we felt summarized morbidity related to TB iris. And this is just uh, showing data on the primary endpoint, showing if you compare the placebo arm to the prednisone arm, there was substantial reduction cumulatively in hospitalization in those patients who received prednisone, and the median also decreased uh, statistically significant, um, suggesting that there was significant reduction in morbidity associated with TB iris if patients were treated with, with prednisone compared to treated with, with placebo. And across a number of secondary endpoints, like symptom score, chest radiology score, CRP as a marker of inflammation, there was more rapid improvement in patients who received prednisone compared to those who received placebo. Interestingly, about 20% of patients in the TB iris, uh, in the prednisone arm, relapsed with TB iris symptoms after stopping the four-week course of, of, of prednisone, suggesting that for a subgroup of patients, four weeks of, of prednisone is, is beneficial but not sufficient in duration. And in terms of adverse events, uh, the important thing here was that there were more mild infections like oral candida and uncomplicated herpes simplex in patients who received prednisone, but no, more uh, uh, no increase in severe infections or metabolic side effects of steroids in patients uh, who received prednisone, and there were no cases of Kaposi sarcoma. When we looked at uh, the, the um, cytokines in the peripheral blood in patients on prednisone compared to those who, who were on placebo, there were significant reductions here showing for interleukin-6 in the patients who received prednisone compared to those who received placebo, and that was seen for a number of other cytokines that were associated with TB iris, like TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, IL-10, IL-12, and, and CXCL-10. So that it seems that perhaps one of the ways in which the effect of pre beneficial effect of prednisone is mediated in TB iris is suppression of these pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, in the peripheral blood and, and presumably in the tissue too. So to summarize in terms of prednisone for the treatment of TB iris, there was no excess of severe infections or metabolic side effects with a four-week course of prednisone. And based on these findings, if a patient is, has a clinical diagnosis of TB iris, uh, and other reasons for uh, deterioration are excluded, and the symptoms are significant, it would justify using prednisone to treat TB iris. To go on to the final part of the talk, essentially uh, looking at the issue of preventing TB iris and the risk for TB iris, across the studies in the literature, these are the three most prominent risk factors for TB iris. Low CD4 count, a short interval between TB treatment and antiretrovirals, and having disseminated TB at, at diagnosis. So the question is, should we delay TB, uh, TB, ART in TB patients to prevent uh, TB iris? And really, you know, uh, there's obviously the flip side to this, and uh, Dick's already referred to this in his talk, is the high mortality associated with a diagnosis of HIV TB and the risk of mortality accruing if, if uh, ART is deferred in, in that patient group. And really, you're balancing out the risk of, uh, it, if, uh, the most important thing is obviously the mortality risk, the mortality associated with starting early, and mortality associated with iris compared to deferring ART, and the mortality associated with HIV progression. And the clinical trials that Dix already summarized uh, looked at um, the, the camellia, the stride and the sapit, looked at this question particularly in uh, looking at starting ART two weeks versus around eight weeks on antiretroviral, on TB treatment, and showed that particularly for those patients with the lowest CD4 count, CD4 count of less than 50, there was major benefit in terms of starting at two weeks compared to deferring to eight weeks with a reduc reduction in mortality in camellia and the composite endpoint of death and AIDS uh, in stride and sapid. So the message is really in, tho in those patients with CD4s of less than 50, we need to start at, at two weeks, and that trumps the, the issue of iris. However, if we look at those patients who do start early, that, and particularly those with the lowest CD4 counts, the combination of having a low CD4 count and starting early in the blue bar compared to deferring uh, 
really drives up the TBI's risk dramatically. Uh, and so you, you have to start early, it saves lives, but at the same time you're going to see a lot more iris, iris cases. And similarly in the stride findings, if you stratify by CD4 count and then you look at early versus later ART, there's a dramatic increase in the risk of iris it, in those patients with the CD4s of less than 50 starting early. So the implications are really CD4 less than 50, start within two weeks, but anticipate that there will be substantially more cases of TB iris as a result of doing this. Patients with CD4 count greater than 50 obviously can defer to around eight weeks. So with that as a background, um, the fact that we need to start these patients with low CD4 counts early, but there's, we can anticipate a lot more TB iris, we really need to think in terms of preventative strategies for TB iris in this patient population group. And we're now conducting a, an EDC, EDCTP funded trial called the PREDAR trial, which addresses this question in terms of using prednisone not as a treatment for TB iris, but as a preventative intervention. Unlike our previous trial, which was a treatment, this is looking at starting prednisone preemptively in patients at high risk for TB iris on the day that they start antiretrovirals. So uh, the, the background is that those patients with low CD4 counts starting early are at high risk of TB iris. TB iris obviously has mortality associated with it in some cases, but more importantly, considerable morbidity and need for hospitalization, and we need an evidence-based uh, preventative strategy. So this is a randomized placebo control, double-blind trial to determine if prednisone given during the first four weeks of antiretrovirals reduces the risk of paradoxical TB iris. Patients with a CD4 count of less than 100 and starting ART within 30 days of TB treatment. And this is just summarizes the design. Essentially, patients on TB treatment starting ART within 30, 30 days, a CD4 count of less than 100, randomized to receive either prednisone or placebo for the first four weeks of the antiretroviral therapy. And this is the dose, 40 milligrams per day for two weeks, followed by 20 milligrams per day for two weeks. And the primary endpoint is the development of paradoxical TB iris. Number of secondary endpoints, including the safety of steroids, the severity of TB iris, and the need for hospitalization, as well as drug reactions, which could potentially be uh, 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 reduced uh, with, with prednisone uh, for its anti-inflammatory effects. So just to end off with, to acknowledge the many colleagues that I've worked with in Cape Town on the TB iris studies, as well as the funders of our previous research and the current trial, the PREDAR trial. Thanks very much. Thanks, Pam. I think we have time for a few questions. That was great. Congratulations on doing those hard trials in a randomized controlled fashion so that we'll get an answer that's meaningful. Um, I'm from Children's Here, and so my question involves this. In babies or in children that have HIV, TB, um, obviously hard to diagnose TB in those children, but given that they may have HIV, TB, in your experience in Cape Town, um, what have you thought about those children? Clearly they have a lower incidence of TB iris uh, by definition, uh, if we can do that. But in the, in the, with the understanding that infants or children who had a perinatally acquired HIV see any neopathogen in a dysfunctional immune regulated state and their um, TNF, gamma interferon, IL 6 uh, responses are going to be muted anyway. Can we learn from those children? They're sort of a I don't know, a knockout, if you will, for uh, lack of the ability to have an appropriate immune response, and could there be a more directed therapy than prednisone yeah. um, to ablate exactly what's wrong with you? Yeah, so, so, so really two questions. The one issue is, is uh, iris in children, and, and that's it, it's been very difficult to study uh, iris, and particularly TB iris in children, for two reasons. One is, is obviously, iris itself doesn't have a, di a diagnostic test. And then you've got a condition, uh, TB in pediatrics, which is seldom confirmed by a diagnostic test. So you've got uh, uh, children who have a presumed diagnosis of TB, of TB and then deteriorate, and 
the question is, did they have TB in the first place, or is this, uh, was it an, another diagnosis? And so it's very difficult to be sure that you're dealing with TB iris because one, you know, one is you're not sure that you're dealing with TB, TB in the first place, and then when they deteriorate, is it because, the, because of iris or because of uh, uh, the, the, the diagnosis was incorrect in the first place? So that's made the research into TB iris in children very difficult, a, a very fraught field, as well as clinical care of those patients. But there certainly have been some cases uh, of very severe TB iris uh, uh, reported, particularly from Tigerberg Hospital, Stellenbosch University, of patients with severe neurological, children with severe neurological TBRs, severe pulmonary and, and manifestations of TBRs. So it is well characterized in, in children, although difficult in, in individual cases, although very difficult to study. Um, so that's, you know, that's the one thing about TBRs in children. The other thing is in terms of more directed therapies. I think that, you know, our work does suggest that we, we you know, that the sort of blunt hammer of steroids might not be appropriate and that one uh, could try a more, di more directed therapies such as interleukin-6 blockade uh, and I've seen, you know, uh, Anton Pozniak in London has used it in, in, in one or two complicated cases of TB iris. TNF-alpha blockade is, is, has also been used. But the problem is that those, those treatments are not widely ac uh, accessible so they're, they're really only ever going to be used in individual refractory cases. And I don't think that they could, uh, you know, given the cost and the accessibility in, in resource limited settings where most TBRs occurs, they're not really going to be practical. Any questions? Yeah, I'll ask quickly, um, Graham. Uh, I was interested in the uh, neutrophilic uh, response in the uh, uh, CNS uh, TB iris, and I'm wondering if that's a more, might be a more uh, general part of the inflammatory response that focused on the lymphocyte lymphocyte sites, some of those cytokines, but uh, for example, in the superative complications, is there a substantial neutrophilic component there, or in the cytokine analysis, did you look at T8 or IL-17? Yeah, so so, um, so, so the, 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 the answer to that is, is we do see an, uh, a neutrophilia in the peripheral blood in patients who develop TBRs compared to controls at two weeks on antiretroviral therapy. So it's not just in the, in the CNS, we do see it in the peripheral blood. In terms of uh, the, the separative complications, when we look at, the, at, at that under a microscope, we just see debris. But we presume that there's a neutrophilic uh, infiltrate. And what, what my view is that the, the neutrophils are probably the effector response uh, you know, that come downstream as a result of other uh, earlier triggering events for, for TB iris. Because you know, the separation only tends to occur a few weeks after the, um, after the development, the initial enlargement. So, th so that neutrophils are associated, but they're probably not the trigger for, they're, they're more likely the effector response. In terms of IL-17, it has been looked for. Some studies have shown elevation. We showed it, uh, didn't show it in the peripheral blood, but we did show it in the CSF that there was IL-17 elevation. One last question. Yes, right here. Uh, you, could you comment for me uh, in the observation that you apparently are not seeing any side effects of the prednisone towards TB itself, right? Because it's usually it's a very immunosuppressive mm -hmm. agent, and uh, we learned that we should not use cortisone in, in TB patients, and you're not seeing any side effect. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I mean. Um you know, Bob Wallace has looked at, at uh, adding steroids to TB treatment uh, in, in terms of actually the, the benefits if, if a patient is established on TB treatment. I think it's different in terms of the risks of, of steroids in patients who are not on TB treatment and can cause TB to flare up. But there are potential benefits in terms of patients who are on TB treatment in terms of uh, and, and the new sort of field of looking at host-directed therapies, essentially that steroids could potentially reduce the, 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 the time to, to culture conversion. Uh, and that's essentially, you know, that the immune response and the fibrosis and the inflammation around the TB and the granuloma might actually protect the, the, the organism from the, the uh, sidal effect of the drug. So th there's never been evidence to show that uh, st steroids worsen TB treatment outcomes if patients are on TB treatment. And there's the potential that, that steroids and anti-inflammatory therapy might have a, a role in augmenting T, TB treatment responses, provided the person is on effective TB treatment. If you had a patient who, was on, who had MDR and you were not treating them properly, 
and now you put them on steroids, you could definitely make the situation worse. But if the patient's on effective TB treatment, there's not evidence that that worsens outcome, and there is the hypothesis that host-directed therapies, anti-inflammatory therapies might improve outcome. Thanks very much, Dan. We'll move on to the next speaker.